In this episode, we're headed west on the Pennsylvania Turnpike to the Steel City in search of something strange. We'll be catching up with admitted yeast obsessive Dennis Hock. He tells how he went from wrangling reptiles to manipulating microflora and tending terroir. All on the quest for a beer that is all about Pennsylvania. Welcome to No Pants During the Pandemic. Kevin Brooks, and this is No Pants During the Pandemic. It's been two months since our last episode, but I'm back with a bunch of new ones in late 2020 and early 2021. Today I'm speaking with Dennis Hawk from Strange Roots Experimental Ales in Western Pennsylvania. Hey Dennis, how you doing today? Hey Kevin, how's it going? Not too bad. Let's start with, uh, why don't you tell me who you are and a little bit about yourself. My name is Dennis Hawk. I'm the founder of uh, Strange Roots Experimental Ales. We're out here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we specialize in everything experimental as possible and spontaneously fermented Western Pennsylvania, authentic sour beer. What are the two tap rooms like? Well, Millville's more of like a gastropub type environment. Uh, It's a little smaller. Um, It's right outside the city, whereas Gibsonia is more of a country setting, we'll call it. It's weirdness in the country, and uh, it has a bigger beer garden. And you're in Gibsonia right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm here at Gibsonia. I'm in the hallway. (laughs) (laughs) How did you first get into beer? I've always been interested in beer and fermentation sciences. So a long time ago when I was 17 years old, I was very interested in seeing what took place during the process of fermentation. And I would go out into the woods and I'd collect organisms with a simple science kit and bring them in and ferment them, look at them under microscopes, things like that. Um, It just always fascinated me that there's so many available and they're so abundant and not a lot of people know their ins and outs about them. What beers did you get into at first? Well, um, the unfortunate side is I wasn't old enough to actually drink them, but um, I was into a lot of the wild and sour beers um, primarily, and there was very few at the time. It was primarily everything from Belgium. Then Saisons and things like that started to entice me as well. I don't know. Just those different beers are, um, you know, yeah, they just always interested me. And so, you know, this interest in, uh, you know, in yeast and microorganisms, I guess, then played into what you decided to study in college? Um, Actually, no. Um, Believe it or not, I went to school and I studied and I published as an undergrad in herpetology. And that was always my love, believe it or not, herpetology. But then again, I've always been interested in numerous sciences. And during that time frame, it's almost like you discover something that you loved so much and you didn't even realize that you loved it at the time until you figure it out over that period. So although I, you know, I'm looking at herpetology, I'm studying herpetology, I'm taking as many different courses as I can, you start to realize, oh my God, I never even thought of beer as a possibility. I never thought of micro as a possibility. I never thought of that. And then when it hits you, it's like, wow, I, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. Just for the folks uh, playing along at home, what's herpetology? <laughs> uh, it's a study of reptiles and amphibians. All righty. My goal in herpetology really was to discover or develop some sort of, even if it would be a piece of it, uh, to create some sort of a synthetic antivenin that could be used uh, worldwide, even in third world locations to help save lives. What made you decide to, you know, I guess forego you know, reptiles and amphibians and open a brewery? I met so many people that were so much smarter than me in academia. And these people you watched as they cradled and spent their entire lives publishing on specific topics 
I loved what they did and I loved their passion for it. But then you start to realize the sad side of it. You dedicate your entire life to all this and it's great. Don't get me wrong. And you're furthering science, but there's very few people that will actually end up reading any of your work. And that's not necessarily because of what you're doing or what it's about, but it, you have to understand that at that level, there's very few people that are going to pick up your papers and read them. So unless it's something of significance or, you know, and I don't mean that like, like your cure for cancer or something, obviously some people are going to be very interested in that. But if you develop a new way to even bioassay new venoms or something or anything, right? Very few people are going to see that, but you could take that same science. You could take that same love of that science and apply it into something like beer and you know, the a hundred thousand maybe or more would actually drink technically your white paper. They would drink your research and hopefully you put a smile on their face. When did you open the brewery? Uh, we opened the brewery in 2011. It was under a different name called dry log. You know, since that time we've transitioned into the new name. That, that was actually my next question about dry log. Yeah. Why was it dry log and why did you change the name? So dry log was founded on using spontaneous fermentation and only what nature gave us here in Western Pennsylvania. When we transitioned from that into strange roots, experimental whales, at the time we were contemplating making clean beer and we've never really made a lot of clean beer or clean beer in general, quite frankly. I mean, we did, but it was sparingly at best. Knowing that we wanted to get into these different markets and knowing that dry log was established based upon that cultured science of organisms or indigenous organisms, and knowing that we wouldn't be doing that with the new products that we'd be manufacturing, I didn't feel it was right to keep the name. Although we still do spontaneous fermentation, we still do all of our cultured products that are here that we go out and actually get and we forage for ingredients and organisms. We do that. But we also make IPAs and stouts and lagers now and things that we've never done in the past. So where did the name Strange Roots come from then? We went to go visit some friends of ours that also have a brewery out of state. And while we were there, um, we were having a few beers and we had told this individual, you know, friend of ours, basically what we were going to do. And he initially was like, I don't think you guys should do that at all. And we started talking about it, why we wanted to do it and the, the change in the process and everything involved. And then surprisingly, he was like, you know what, now that you've said all that, I think it's a great idea to change the name. He actually added the experimental part into the name. He had suggested it. He said, you know, I don't see very many people doing that. The basis of what you're doing is exactly who you are. You guys are always experimenting with something different, something new. And I think it would lend itself to your name. So we adopted that. I don't know. We figured the roots part, we've always, dry log was always a strange brewery doing strange things. And that was our roots. Changing the name of the company, you know, in a business uh, regard, it's, yeah. you know, that's a brutal decision, you know. Uh, oh, it is. It was very difficult to do. And we still get people today that continue to ask about the name change and continue to ask, oh, weren't you somebody else? Oh, I remember when you're so-and-so. And it's like, yeah, well, you got to keep in mind, that was probably two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago. So things have developed quite a bit since that time. But in beer world, it's almost like it's frozen. But it's neat to see people acknowledge the old name and still have the t-shirts and still have the beers and stuff. It's, it's really cool. Even though you did touch on this with the, the dry log, what's Strange Roots all about? It's a mixture, really. It's a, it's, it's a conglomerate of traditional farmhouse ales, which is what we love to do, but just basically based out of the terroir here of Western Pennsylvania. And now that we're getting more into the clean beer side of things, I would think of us as we run the gamut. I know that what we do best is, is the strange experimental things, but it's such a small portion of our portfolio just knowing that the market isn't always demanding beers like that. So from a business perspective, although that's what I would love to do, and that's what we did at Drylog, um, it's not always the best to do it that way and specialize in one type. You guys have two locations, and as you said, not everybody's going to want these wild or sour esoteric beers. So, you know, you need beers to get butts in the seat. So you sure. want the easier drinking beers, hotter drinking beers, I guess. IPAs are the predominant craft style right now. Yeah. So 
it makes sense to have an IPA on tap for a hophead who happens to walk in who doesn't know yeah. what your strongest suit is. And honestly, we've been able to bridge that gap quite a bit because for the first few times that we try to make IPAs, we failed miserably. It's not as easy as you think it would be. And I always, I've never had an affinity for IPAs. I was never an IPA person. However, when you start tasting some of the really creamy fruit forward ones, really, you know, that term that they use juicy, not so much the dank world, but you start to have an appreciation for that beer and that style as well. And I never did have that until probably about a year ago. I was definitely late into that as well. That's okay. It's however you navigate, you navigate. And most people, that's their first introduction into either artisanal or craft beer. You know, looking at it from the outside in, I can see why people really enjoy those beers. But the problem is, again, we didn't have any experience making them. So we had to find some people to actually teach us how to do it. And we reached out to some people and some people were helpful, others not so much. But that being said, um, it took us quite a bit of time and I have a whole new appreciation for that style. It's very chemistry dependent. Um, and that's, that's what fascinates me about it. Now, how do you get your, how do you wrap your head around, you know, with your wild ales, mm -hmm. you know, these beers have for the most part a very long shelf life. Yeah. And then you've got your IPAs, which have no shelf life. No shelf uh, life. How do you wrap your head around the differences in that? That's always difficult um, to do, uh, definitely, for sure. However, what we try to do with some of the IPAs and some of the fresher beers is, is that we don't make them in as large quantities. And if we do, we try to get them sold ahead of time. So we would contact some of the people that would want to carry our products or out in possibly Philadelphia and see if they're interested in it. And that adds more of a logistics thing to the beer rather than instead just appreciating it and trying to get it out. But we definitely have to cater to that schedule as well as yeast too, because you put that yeast in a brink and you don't have a very long time to reuse it. So, you know, it, it's causes a bit more scheduling issues than anything. And you guys started doing some seltzers too, right? Yeah, we did. We dabbled in some seltzers. While I'm not a huge fan of that scene, it's a smart business move to put you know, people I. in there. Our thing with seltzers is, is that we wanted them to be real fruit. Anything we make out of our brewery, we want it to be real. We want it to not have flavorings, not to be fake. So when you see enough of them out there, it's just like, I know I can do that better and I'm going to do it the real way, the way that nature intended it to be. Not to say that seltzers are what nature intended them to be, but that, you know, if you're going to taste strawberry, you might as well buy some strawberries, not just flavoring. My favorite ones have been in a couple of the breweries where they're doing exactly what you say. They want real flavors in there, not flavoring. That's exactly um, right. One of the breweries nearby did a you know lovely one with like sage, and you know you're not going to oh, yeah. see that. You know, White Claw's not going to be making something. No, with... absolutely uh, not. So it's uh, it's pretty cool to you know to see that aspect of it. Of the sure. basically, I guess the craft aspect of seltzer, I guess. Yeah. Which, Yo, that's that's actually a good way to put it, Kevin. Um, <laughs> even though it hurts my heart to even say it. <laughs> yeah, um, I know there's a bunch of different ways to make it. Um, sure. You know, if you're keeping your integrity, then fine, it's all cool. And that's exactly uh, yeah, that's where we're at with that. And now you're also making lagers as well. I mean, yes. While a lager is you know clean and you know the. Your wild beers are most definitely not clean. You know, yeah. I, in some ways, they actually kind of make a little more sense because time, you know, like to me, a good lager, it takes time to make. Oh, uh, where sure. a, good, a good wild beer takes a lot of time to make. And I love, I love that a lot of people are getting back into lagers. I've always liked them. I've always appreciated them. Um, I don't know. I think it's really neat. There's these stages in craft beer. Um, yep. The initial stage and, you know, with drinkers as well, but, you know, even in the business, you know, the initial stage in the late eighties into the, into the nineties, they wanted to get as far away from lager as possible. So yeah. everybody looked to man, more or less England first Ales. and yeah. then eventually to Belgium and beyond. But, uh, there were a few freaky standouts, most of whom are actually in Pennsylvania who made lagers back then. Yeah. Um, but here now you flash forward another decade, two decades, and the traditional beers, the beers that we looked to first in the 90s, 
nobody wants those now. So like the lower alcohol ales session beer, finally, it seems like it's maybe starting to get going, but I think it's still got a long way to go, but it's nice to see lagers getting a nice foothold, you know, good quality lagers getting a foothold. And I hope that these sessionable ales that were are British inspired will kind of come back. I'm babbling now, but we, you know, it happens. I apologize. <laughs> it's all right. I like nuanced beers and they're just not, they don't sell, you know, exceptionally well. So it's like you finally, you go someplace and you find one and then you're all excited. And then you drink it and you realize it's, you know, two years old and yeah, you know, it's like, uh, let's move on. You know, earlier you mentioned, uh, terroir and, yes. uh, I guess explain, you know, to everybody out there what a ter- what terroir me- actually means. It's everything involved in your local microclimate. So you have soil consistency, you have the rain, the amount of humidity and the, the temperature, everything down to what makes that specific to that region and why that tastes very special. That's in a nutshell terroir. So nobody ever really related terroir into the beer world. It was always primarily in the wine world. And it makes sense. Again, if you, you know, as an example, if you look at a specific type of grape, so let's take Cabernet. If you grow Cabernet grapes in Italy at a specific altitude, it's going to be very different than a grape or a crop that's grown in Mexico at a different altitude with a different climate. And Ultimately, what you end up with is two very different products because of that. In beer world, it's not so much just the ingredients, but it's also the organisms themselves. When I taste spontaneously fermented beer from different parts of the country, they're very different because specific organisms are either more abundant or maybe they don't make it this far uh, east um, in comparison to any spontaneously fermented breweries out west. They might have a higher population size or a lower population size of different variations of genetically different Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Britannomyces, every organism that you can think of that's going to be or lend its special hand into this beer is going to be very different based upon where you're at in the world. And that's why Western Pennsylvania spontaneously fermented beer is going to taste different than a spontaneously fermented beer, let's say, in Washington State. It's just going to be different. And that's terroir at its best. With beer, I think what also adds into the, I guess the terroir not really becoming part of this until more recently, mm-hmm. is that at least now, almost everybody's getting their grain and their hops from the same few places, especially sure. grain. You know, we're just starting to really see craft uh, malteries opening up, for lack of a better term. We've Um, had one here for a long time. In fact, the gentleman that I was with in the military, we chewed some dirt together. He started a uh, farm back here. So we do get our grain locally and we do get our hops locally and age them ourselves. So uh, all of them for spontaneously fermented beer only. Um, But that, that adds an element to ours where I can say for a fact, this is Western Pennsylvania in a glass. And that to me is more important than anything else. Now that craft beer has spread through the world, where styles used to be, you know, to a region or to a city, you know, in like Mm -hmm. Germany's case, you know, now everybody's making everything. So really that's the only way you're getting something that's speaking to to where you're from is to do that. You're right. I think that's the saddest byproduct of, of the craft beer scene is that the individual areas have lost their, uh, uniqueness yeah um, i would agree i mean the nice thing is that i can get a fresh you know alt beer you know that may actually be made incredibly well you know down the road yeah Anywho, yeah while you don't barrel age your clean beers you do barrel age most of your uh wild stuff right just just about everything yeah and you're, you you have a cool ship too for your spontaneous beers correct Yep, since 2011, we've had our cool ship. How are you guys utilizing the cool ship? So what we do is is that when we process spontaneously fermented beer, first of all, we got to make sure that the outside temperatures are correct. We always look for below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I guess the air quality is much better, reduces pollen content, um, and there's a higher affinity for it carrying microorganisms at a lower temperature and getting rid of some of the ones that you don't necessarily want, like vegetative pathogens. We'll boil it, and as soon as we're done doing the boil cycle in the kettle, 
will actually transfer that up into the coal ship, allow it to cool down. By the next day, it's usually at room temperature, if not lower. And then from there, we transfer directly into fresh, clean barrels that are reused, but we do clean them out. We ozone them, and then we transfer it right into the barrels and allow the fermentation to take place. Once the fermentation's done, uh, we bung them up and put them on a rack and forget it ever happened. How long are you barrel aging on average? You know, the spontaneous, but also some of the other beers. I'd say the majority of our beers outside of spawn fermented beers will go anywhere from nine months to 15 months. With spontaneously fermented beers, we try to get two seasons if we can. For some of the products that we make that are like our spontaneous roots line is um, we make a vintage or we call it vintage. We didn't want to use the term goose. It is very much a Western Pennsylvania blend of three-year-old beer, two-year-old beer, and one-year-old beer in different proportions. And we don't want to get into that because it's not Lambic. But for those beers, sometimes we have vintages up to four years in casks that will pull down into that. Um, I think that's the oldest that we have currently in casks right now. It's about four years. With your wild beers, do you want to walk me through some of those wild beers? So like, um, I don't know, like Good Knocked. That is a dry log beer that's stuck around for a very long time. We still call it a farmhouse ale. It's a uh, merge between cider, meat, and beer technically in one, but it's still something that we continuously want to make and we have a market for it and people love to drink it. We have beers like our Plague. Our Plague series was just released. It's a barrel-aged sour stout that's aged in petite Syrah casks. And that's been going on now for, I think this is our fifth year or sixth year doing Plague. And it's grown since then and we've added beers to it as well. And then we have our forage series that we typically do every year. Other than this year, we decided not to do it. Obviously, with the state of everything going on and the chaos, we decided not to do it. But we'll go into the woods and we'll either find ingredients or ingredients plus microorganisms that we can pull from there to make a beer that's specific to Western Pennsylvania. And it's all foraged out here. And then outside of that, you know, it's just either spontaneously fermented beer or if we know that it's inoculated and we just want it to be wild, we don't call it obviously spontaneously fermented. We'll just call it barrel-aged sour beer or we'll just call it sour beer. So your love of yeast is definitely uh, uh, obsession might be the word I use, I guess. I um, agree. You've gotten your yeast from some pretty odd places, haven't you? Yeah, that I have, that I have. We always try to figure out some interesting places to find it. So, you know, like Relic would be a good example. That's the one that we got from that uh, 16th century monastery cabinet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. That uh, was a cool experiment. That included a lot of people from academia that were friends of mine. And the big issue was we had to come up with an innocuous solution that would dissolve wax but still maintain the integrity of the strain, not killing a eukaryotic cell while it's in its dormancy state. That was the most difficult part of that whole process. But uh, we got the strain out, we made beer with it, and we still make beer with it now, and it's great. <laughs> Some other examples that we try to do, I'm just trying to think, oh, Grand Blue, that's another one too. Oh, that's, damn, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about that. Grand Blue is actually done with Penicillium for, uh, Rochaforti. Uh, which is the critter that makes blue cheese, blue cheese. It, uh, it's what creates the mold. And that was interesting. And that was just, it, and it won't go through alcoholic fermentation, but when the mycelium grow down through the cask, it lends itself to have a pellicle that's a blue green color. So the, so the penicillium is growing on top and it's mycelium are embedding itself down inside of the cask of the beer, almost like fingers, if you will. And there's definitely some sort of chemical conversion that takes place there. Whether it's enzymatic or not, I don't necessarily know. But when you smell that beer, it literally smells like the faintest funk of blue cheese. And that's from the penicillium. So again, it doesn't go through alcoholic fermentation, but it adds a lot of those notes to the product itself. I love that beer. So with the wild beers, how long is a bottle of one of those good for? Well, we always say 10 years. Um, that's what we say. Um, now I know that they could go longer than that, but I uh, self assured or rest assured. I can say 10 years for sure. Mid-March, yeah. basically the country, well, hell, the world shuts down. You know, how does, how does strange roots reply? How do you guys react to this? 
in my lifetime, I have never experienced anything like this. And I don't think anybody alive today could actually say that either or would disagree with that. I mean, we, we were just shocked. Initially, when we shut down and they shut down all business operations, the good part was is that in the state of Pennsylvania, they deemed us as essential. So we could continue to manufacture our products. We just couldn't actually sell them outside of just curbside pickup. And the great part is, is that we have the best customers. We have the best followers. And I can't thank them enough for supporting us through this entire process. We were able to stay okay. And we were able to keep people employed. And... Um, you know, it was very difficult and it's still very difficult now. And I would just, I would urge everybody to continue to do what's right. And, um, you know, hopefully we can get out of this all together. So you guys had to shut down both tap rooms. When were you able to reopen them? Well, that was another thing. We were allowed to open and then the cases spiked and they shut everybody down again. And then we were allowed to open again, but only at 25% capacity. And we had a water pipe bust in the brewery and pretty much decimate our entire tap room, bathrooms, our laboratory, our kitchen, our cooler room, all decimated. So we just recently reopened again. And luckily, we're allowed now up to a 50% capacity as long as we self-certify, which we have. And um, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been a roller coaster. You know, the weather is starting to turn a little cold. Um, yes. what do you foresee for, well, you guys, but also I guess Pittsburgh, um, as you know, we head into the colder months. I know that a lot of people are trying to drive this outside eating, dining, whatnot. I don't know. Pittsburgh's a very cold city and it gets cold now. Granted in the past few years, we've had some mild winters and we were lucky. However, this year, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think everybody's got to just calmly kind of just get by. That's, that's what I think. I don't think anybody's going to be doing exceptionally well. I think there are going to be a lot of business closures. I really do. Um, and it's unfortunate. But I think that if we could just kind of scrap our way along until something, I don't know whether they develop a vaccine or this dissipates or they can figure out a way to get it under control. I think at that point in time, as business gets back to normal, it'll be okay. But making it through that's going to be very difficult for everybody. This industry, you know, the, al the alcohol industry, but specifically the restaurant and bar industries have almost been vilified a little bit. They seem to be getting yeah. smacked a little bit harder than others. And I know that, you know, when people drink, they can tend to get stupid, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's disproportionate to the reactions that, a, you know, you know, meanwhile, somebody can go to a store and, you know, there's a thousand people in the store and you're allowed to have like 20 in your in your place. There's no continuity to what they're saying. One minute it's okay to do this, next minute it's not okay to do this, and one minute you have to do it this way, and then the next minute you have to do it this way. And I know that it's a pandemic, and I know that it's a virus that we've never dealt with before, but it just makes it very difficult for us to pre-plan. You hurry up and put all this into it. You hurry up and try to keep it going. And it's not, again, you're just trying to do it to keep everyone employed. You're just trying to keep jobs. That's all you're trying to do. And that's what we're trying to do as well. It just gets difficult when the rules change and nobody tells you until after the rules change and then you catch up to those rules and then they change them again. Yeah. And the rules, you know, like I said, the rules just seem different for, you know, the service industry versus so many of the other I would agree. You know, industries. I think if it was uniform, people would yeah. be unhappy, but yeah, it would be. Uh, equitable, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah, approach uh, it from a public health issue. Approach it from a public health issue, and if that's the concern, then great, address it on that level. But I don't think there's so many states doing so many different ways and so many different things, and it's some are completely open, some are completely closed. And you, you really can't, in my mind, again, not to get into this, but, you know, you, it's just going to be very difficult for a lot of different businesses and, you know, some continuity would be very appreciative. That's all. Agreed. If somebody wants your beers right now, how can they get them? If you're located in the state of Pennsylvania, you can get onto our website and order directly from there. Um, if you're outside the state of Pennsylvania, unfortunately, currently we're not distributing anything outside the state of Pennsylvania. 
Um, but if you can find it, great, let us know. Um, or if you're going to happen to be stopping by at any point in time, uh, shoot us an email and we'll be more than happy to set stuff aside for you. Excellent. Dennis, thanks for spending all this time with me. You know, best of luck getting through all of these crazy uh, times. Thanks, Kevin. I really do appreciate it. And thanks for having me. This was awesome. I'll speak with you soon, man. All right, buddy. If you'd like to learn more about Strange Roots or a Pennsylvania resident who would like to purchase some beer, then check out their website. This is the first episode of season two of No Pants. In over 25 years working in television, this is the first time that I hoped that there would not be another season of the show. Sadly, the pandemic is surging, resulting in new shutdowns across the world, with more on the horizon. Just today, I heard of two bars permanently closing, while others are planning on shuttering through the winter. Bottom line, these small, independent companies, really people, need your help. So if you can, please support them. Buy a six-pack, get some takeout, some freshly roasted coffee or baked goods, purchase their music, do whatever you can to help them get through this. Most importantly, please take care of yourself and your loved ones. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Be well. Be well.